Morning, morning. Yeah, I, I figure competing between food and here, and most people probably went to get the food over there, so <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> uh, how many from the 311, 516, any of the brigades, battalions? Just a couple of you. Okay, that's all. Okay, because I'm supposed to be over, what time? You said 1 o'clock, right? 1 o'clock, 1 30. I'll be over there anyway, so I can sit down and talk a little more detail on the Army Enterprise Service S. Uh, my name is Palmer Mitchell. I am the project officer for ASD today. It may change tomorrow. All right. I'm also the, the deputy for um, product lead enterprise computing, which is under enterprise services, which is under PEOEIS, uh, and we're out of Fort Belvoir. So if you're not familiar with the Army Enterprise Service Desk, uh, this is probably going to give you a quick overview of what the Army Enterprise Service Desk is. And where we are and where we're going. And then we're specifically going to look at what's happening here in the Pacific and Korea. That's what we're going to just touch on. All right. This is an agenda. The Army Enterprise Service Desk. Where did it come from? Where did it start? About 10 years, I mean, FY10 is when they actually started to do the Army Enterprise Service Desk, uh, beginning with the 7th, 7th SIG, if you're familiar with it. So they started to set up and move to the concept of an Army Enterprise Service Desk. That included 44 of the NICs, getting them all together, and that's over a four-year period it took to get all those installations to come together and get them finally in somewhat of a, a, a enterprise level help desk where we all have the same type of enterprise services and some of the things you look at they're similar across the board. That was considered phase one. Phase two was to get not only the service desk that we have CONUS but to get the ones also OCONUS and other service desks that may not be uh, a NEC. Um, we have also other installations. You have uh, MCOM who's looking at also using this type of service throughout also. So from a concept, that's where we started. Where they want to go, we'll talk about some of the issues and things where they're moving to and some of the challenges that we're having. Probably not a good slide, and I'll show you what those other things on the side are actually saying in another slide, but just the overall picture of where we want to go and where we, with CONUS already on board. We already talked to Southcom. Um, we're here in Pacific, also Korea, and also Southwest Asia. That's some of the things we're looking at. Uh, Europe, the fifth SIG, they're already mature uh, service desks, uh, but again, part of the, the ASD Federation to be is what we wanted to call them. How the Federation piece came together. So you had the help desk. We wanted a place where, again, where we can get users, get a common place that they can have issues and get their service done. And when it, no matter where you went, you wanted to have the same feel, same look, and everything else. When you call, you got the same type of service. And that was the whole purpose of it. But the issue you have with uh, when CRG6 said, hey, we want to go out for a little further, the first thing, did it have the authority to make everybody say, hey, something like the NMCI. You familiar with NMCI, NMCI, what the Navy did when they took, in, took everything and contracted it out? Same concept the Army wanted to do also. But again, no authority. Then you have everybody who has their own piece of the pie that don't want to play. And you can't force them to play. So it's really it's those are the willing versus the one that you know you can make. Some of the other desks to be, as you look through it, may not be in existence right now, but we have talked to also to the reserves and guard. Probably next year, we'll probably see them move aboard also, your reserve and guard into the using the Army Enterprise Service desk as a whole. So they will be incorporated into this federation. Um, 
So the G6, knowing that there were some already, some mature desks out there, said, you know what, I find all the mature desks, and we're going to say, you know what, we're going to have success. We call them part of the Federation. We bring them all together and say, yeah, we did it. So, and you'll find out that even those who are a part of the Federation don't really play until they really need something. And again, money talks. When money starts getting short, you see a little more of them come towards the, the Federation piece. And that's what we, again, we're encouraging them to move freely to see what we have, see what we offer. But at the same time, they have the freedom to do in their theater, the way they operate, the way they want to do it, tailor it for them. But the, the key to this whole thing is knowledge articles, getting them out, pushing them out. And we'll talk about that also. So the Army Enterprise Service Act falls under the PMO. We're an acquisition organization, not operators. But when you have no operator who owns you, or wants to claim that AKO, prime example, falls in the same within our headquarters, same thing. No operator really wanted it, so it falls back into the acquisition community and we continue to run it. Same with the Army Enterprise Service Desk. There's an initiative out there, we had a study done and it's been briefed to uh, General Baker. Uh, uh, it's also been to CIO, General Farrell. So it's all been briefed where we're trying to find who really belong, who should the Army, Army Enterprise Service Desk belong to? Who should ultimately be running that? And right now, the last word we've gotten, and everyone's agreeing, probably going to NETCOM. Something that they, sh they should be doing, they should be running. Uh, yet, the quickest I can get it out of my hand, get it to an operator, it, it's great. It's great for me. Because what I want to do is do the acquisition, get it out, get it ready, get it prepared, move on. The next type of service that comes out there, enterprise services, comes back through the acquisition community, get it out there, push it out again, hand it back over to the operator, and they continue to move on. But uh, as it is right now, again, it falls within our headquarters, falls with that, we have that mandate, and again, that's two, tier zero and tier one supports what we do. Barriers. Quite a few barriers. Uh, one, again, I talked about authority. Uh, we really don't have the authority, and it's really those of the willing versus those who uh, are within organization. The more and more that we, the funds are cut, more and more you, you see the IMOs are going away, that's when you see more of a, hey, can you help me? What can you do for me? What do you have? What do you offer? So you have more people knocking on the door now saying, hey, I want to be a part of this federation. I want to know what's going on with you know, the Army Enterprise Service. Desk. How can they help me? You know, are you going to pay for everything? Well, the first thing I usually tell them, who's paying for it now? So if, who's ever paying for it now? What we do is give you the capability to have that enterprise level. We wrap it up in some of those services that we'll talk about also, the enterprise services. But overall, again, there's no policy. The policy, again, how do you get that policy across the board? Uh, I know when we sit down, you talk to SOCOM, you talk to the different, even the, the next, still you have some difficulties. And when you're making changes and everything else, some will have the changes done today. Next, one will have a couple weeks from now. Before they, there's still some, some operation uh, I would say still, some people don't move as fast as they should. And again, what is the authority we have? Really none. We push out the policies out there, you need to follow the policy, and a lot of things are a little slower than it should be. And then again, once you get it to our operator's hand, it will fall into them, and they, are, they have the authority to move these guys and to have them come on board. And that touches that. Again, the goal of the Federation is really Again, everybody seeing the same thing, a user having the same experience no matter where they go, they, they know what to do. Uh, another thing we want to talk about in, in that arena is it's an empowerment of the IMOs. Once again, if I know wherever I go, what I'm doing, it's the same thing, it makes it easier. 
So some of the things in our SLAs, you've, you've experienced uh, slower times of, uh, uh, your, for your calls being answered. A lot of things will change if first we get the knowledge out there and we have something that's similar that makes a difference where I go, who's the operator and everything else. And they have a call management system that the, this particular vendor is using that will help and assist overall getting the right skill level personnel to assist in your particular problem. So the calls are directed to that particular skill level personnel as opposed to getting something that they can't solve and again relating that call to someone else. So there is a way, there is a process in there that we can do that. Uh, anything else I'm missing in that? Let's hit on that one. What the key in evident technology, call management systems, one of the first things you want to look at. Uh, knowledge management, again, the goal is to push knowledge forward. We can get the knowledge out there, the, the different help desks, different types of help desks, the different, some of the issues you have, some of the problems they have. If we get the knowledge out ahead of you, where you can read it, where the user can go through, and some of, some of the, they can answer themselves before it gets to the, the tier one, the tier two, and it has to be escalated. We want to push that out forward. So that's a, one of the things you have with the, the enterprise service desk. Um, again, some of the B2B and the workforce management system, which is what I was talking about earlier. Again, they, they take those level, skill level workers and they know when you clock in, they know your level of cert certification, what you're capable of, when you're logging on, and when you're logging off, and they route those particular calls that you should be able to handle to that particular uh, technician. And at the same time, if it's a higher level, that person's logged in, it will automatically send it to them, and they can actually answer their call. And again, SLAs are much better than when you have someone that's familiar with it. Uh, another issue you find out, facilities. You know, we don't have a lot of space and a lot of things, so I can do it. The same call a lot of different places. You won't know, you won't know the difference. Once you get your ticket in, drive it to the right person, and it's solved. Uh, we're gonna see another thing, some of the issues we have uh, in, in doing this. You know, less touch labor you're gonna have, remote systems. Uh, we have the, what's it, BombGuard. Uh, we have a remote desktop. Now, we, a lot of work getting it established, getting it in, and now with Windows 10 coming on board, maybe, maybe a change. Uh, a lot of things are locked down with Windows 10. Uh, Talked to Fist Sig, they found a workaround, but don't know how secure that is. So again, we're, we have that capability now, don't know if we'll have it once Windows 10 is pushed out throughout the, the network, that, that particular uh, Software push will probably change a lot of things, the way we do business. Uh, again, we're looking at it, testing it, and, and looking, out, looking at some of the workarounds that we can do. Again, training and CRMs. So we do have CRMs that, that come with uh, as part of the, the help desk. Uh, we actually have a couple reps here Normally what we do when we set up a desk, we actually send, I call it our CETA folks, they actually work with the contractor. They are assigned also to that organization and that desk, and they assist in ensuring that that contract is doing the tasks and the quality assurance of, those, the, of the work that they're doing is being fulfilled. So we have those assigned there. We also have business process managers also uh, located. A lot of times you go to the organization, some of their processes, they don't know themselves. So that business process person will actually assist them in cataloging, documenting what they do, how they do it, and how we can incorporate what we do into what they're doing. And if it's their processes are good and mature, we will use those same processes and keep them on board. And those that are not mature, that we have something that may be better, we incorporate that. So they have, we, we don't leave you as you come in, as the desk is established, we don't leave you sitting there and saying, hey, what next? And we have someone, we have someone to assist you. 
always continually, and they're part of your organization and you're incorporated part of your organization throughout. The goal is self-service. Uh, again, if I could get a user to answer his own question, it's probably the cheapest way I can get business done. So if I can push them down, push knowledge article, you know, if you have this problem, this is what you need to do. Instead of me waiting on a phone, I would prefer if I could fix it myself, let me do my own thing. But if I had to sit on, wait for a call, wait on a thing, again, it's going to cost a little more and, and a little more time. So again, self-service is the first thing we want to look at. So shifting left, starting with the basic user, and then moving forward to the tier one, two, which is Army and Prize Service Dev, before you go up to uh, your tier three and above. Again, if I can do it myself, much cheaper, much faster. Let's look at ASD Pacific. Again, uh, I'll probably be down there to talk to you specifically on some of your things, but again, it is a tier zero, tier one support for your IT services. No more than that. I, I know I've been asked different locations, hey, do you do tier two? Well, a contractor will do anything you want for the right price and <laughs> right amount of money. They will do it. But what we're providing right now is just a tier zero and tier one support. 24-7 here at Fort Shafter. Um, I think I have a timeline next that will kind of show you what's going on with that. And then Korea also, we're doing that simultaneously. Uh, Korea might finish before we actually finish Paycom. But we're looking at, uh, again, I said Paycom. Pack. I'm sorry, I've been in the theater a whole lot too, in and out. But again, when we use probably use this theater as a, a backup, as a coop for Korea, the Korea help desk is standing up. So, go ahead. Mm-hmm. So don't I? You are from Korea, so Hawaii may not be sleep right now. Hawaii, the plan is twenty-four-seven. That's the plan. So you are. They are the backup for Korea. I know Korea right now is not twenty-four-seven. It's you know. But uh, the plan right now is that would be your backup and your coop. And same thing, if there's some calls that cannot be answered, it would be you know, queued and ready in the box for. And, and that's, again, the BPR that we put on the ground would check your policy, your, your SP, how do you operate, write it all down and say, okay, where do you want the call to go when you're not in operational? And that's what they do. And then they can direct that call wherever. Any other questions? Again, the key thing is SLAs. Uh, we do have some organizations that want to get into the SLAs real quick. And Harry, again, how are you measuring them right now? Uh, the contract has a standard set of SLAs that they have. Again, that may change based off your organization, what's going on, and how you're set up. Uh, depends how mature you are. But right now, they do have a standard and we'll hold them to that standard. But you may have a higher standard. Again, as we go through, finally, you may have to do a modification of the contract. But what the contract has is what the, 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 the contractor will follow according to the contract. Um, but again, those are the things we do measure, uh, ticket accuracy and customer satisfa satisfaction. So they do have a way of measuring all that. And again, I go through this weekly, most of the briefings, and monthly, I get an overall picture of what's going on throughout all the, the service desks. And again, you will have that same capability here at, um, within the pack. Some of the significant dates, uh, we did get the contract signed on the 28th. We had money, we had to get it before the beginning, end of the year, got it on contract. 
which is a key thing. Another key th date was IOC. IOC was defined what we call IOC. In this case, it was having, what, four or five bodies on the ground operating your current situation, your current desk, and that's what we did. We got, I think we got about four, three, four? Got three right now. Got three right now but we wanted to get bodies working with you so we can actually spend that money legally. Uh, so we got that. You see a large gap between there. I don't, I'll got another one to do a little more detail. Uh, next key date up there you see is really the onboarding, is really the facility, because we're actually building a facility. If you don't know the headaches I went through trying to get <laughs> the KO to buy off of building a facility inside, with money, it, 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 was a, it was a big challenge. Uh, it was no, not going to happen. So I had to, in a way, tell them, hey, you know, the facility's not big enough for everybody the way it's set up to get everyone in that facility the way it's laid out now without reorganizing that whole facility to get 28 more bodies in there. We can't do it. Yeah, I know her flag was waving. Yeah, I hear you. But she ended up buying off on it. We signed off on it, and we got it. So, yes, there were some changes somebody wanted to make and everything else. Believe me, every time somebody mentioned it, she kept saying, I don't even know if we should be doing it. So I really, most of that communication, I cut. I said, you know, don't want to hear it. Kale's not going to want to hear it. And we mess around, we won't have anything. There was a point that we were going to stop, pack, and actually go and say, hey, let's go swap. A little easier, less trouble, get more success. But we were already in here, and we were going to stand up Korea. And I said, well, we can't stand up with Korea. If we, if we left PAC, we had to do them all at the same time. So we continue on. So again, when you're done with a contracting officer and dealing with lawyers, it's a little tougher than just saying, hey, yeah, I'm going to do this. I want to put this. I want to add this. doesn't work that quick in the acquisition field. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, again, you see the onboarding of the other organizations. And finally, FOC is when we are done handing it over to you. We did this contract a little bit different than we normally do our other contracts. Um, with seventh, it's part of the main contract. On this particular contract, we did a separate line item. That makes it easier that when we eventually, if we do cut it over, we give you that particular model, hand it over to you, and you continue on the drive on. And Korea will be the same way. If, when we get down to uh, SWA, same way. We'll do line items, separate mod, and that way it makes it easier and smoother when we cut over. When we do a recompete, we're probably going to do seventh the same way. We're actually going to give them their own line item, and that way we can separate them. Uh, so we've already stood up. At the same time we're doing this, we're actually standing up a desk at Fort Belvoir, our sipper nipper desk at Fort Belvoir. We set up a sipper desk in uh, Huachuca. That's, that's new, relatively new also. So there's a lot of changes, a lot of things working. So this is not the only thing project we're actually working on. But it's, at the same time, we're doing uh, four other projects simultaneously. And these are the dates kind of spelled out. Uh, Big deal, furniture order. Here, again, if you don't have all your furniture and what you want, and then you got to pay up front when you're dealing with some of these the, the contractors. They want 50% up front. And if you make a change, just that much longer, trying to get stuff ordered to meet a timeline. So again, there was a cutoff date. I made the decision, hey, that's it. Can't make no more changes. Let's move on, because if we make a change again, I still got to go through the contracting officer. And again, I meet with her every week. And I just, every time I, this, the issue comes up with PACOM uh, in Hawaii, I try to get her to come also to this, to, to see what you have, what's going on. But she decided she would wait until the facility is actually built. Probably was a good idea because she probably would look around and say, well, there's plenty of room for people here and plenty of room for there. And you, you never know. See what she got for the money. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she is a a good steward of, that, of, the, of the funding and, and ensure that the contractor is doing what they're supposed to be doing and not outside that contract. Uh, let's see, anything else on here? I think we 
hit most of those already. And current operations. Again, we have, we have uh, three. Three agents. We have Tammy also is here that supports the organization, uh, part of the CEDAR team that we have. And then Obi came down from the seventh, was part of the CEDAR team there. Uh, wealth of experience of how the seventh did it. There's a lot of lessons learned. Some things we want to do, some things we don't want to do. So we have the lessons learned, we want to follow the lessons learned. We don't want to repeat some of those same mistakes. Uh, we do, again, like talking to the fifth, a very mature organization as far as the service desk. Uh, they're already moving ahead to win 10. They're already moving ahead. And you were talking about 8.1. There's a lot of things already changing. They're already doing. They're already experienced. And we want to take off those lessons that they're learned and apply it to the other desks that we're standing up. Uh, I think that was my last slide. And my subject to your questions, I am here to talk about specifically your organization. Go ahead. I actually have a question, Palmer. Mm -hmm. um, when I put this together, I put it together pretty much for the Pacific. Yeah. Um, we do have some folks here from Korea. Can you give some insight as to kind of what their timeline is? Do you have that? Also, how many we have from Korea besides you? You got you? Just, okay. Uh, so, Korea is a little slower. You have SOFA you have to deal with. So uh, we did get some bodies on the ground. Initially, we had a, uh, we actually got a, a CETA person. As soon as she came in, she hadn't been on the ground. I, I get, got to meet her, and probably two weeks later, we had her on a plane headed to Korea. Uh, good thing she had an ID card that she can get in the ground. So we had some things that we did. They had furniture already, some of the furniture and some equipment was already bought prior, so that was on the ground also. So we had no one to actually receive that furniture and everything, but she's on the ground, they've been inventory. So a lot of things that's staged, pre-staged already for Korea. Um, FOC, I think we're, we have a, we have one business person actually on the ground uh, there's actually a, another contractor on the ground. Again, the biggest hurdle is getting through the SOFA. Uh, and as quick as we can get those, that process, uh, it's a learning curve for, for the contractor and, and overall trying to figure out how do I get them in there, who's going to sponsor them. Uh, we finally got someone who's going to sponsor and sign them in. Uh, again, once Korea kicks off, we've already been given a facility to work out of. Uh, once they kick off, I, I really foresee them being done prior to this desk being done because everything's there already in place. Uh, the difficulties of that is, again, hiring other folks. And in the facilities, the security, security concerns of uh, working with local nationals and who can do what in the particular buildings and getting those contractors, make sure they're certified to actually work in those facilities to at least build them out like they should be. Uh, go ahead. If we can get your contact information, we can make sure that you um, can stay in touch with the program office as well as our senior representatives on the um, on the senior affair of Korea. Just keep informed on, on the timeline and how you get Yeah. Yeah, they were initially they were doing meetings uh, weekly, but when you're a meeting and you don't have a contract, it wastes of everybody's time. Because I can't tell you nothing because we don't know anything. Until a contract signed and everything else, and that process, again, I'm at the will of the lawyers, timelines, money, funding, all that plays a part of it. So uh, a lot of the meetings that you were having, it, it was me. I don't want to say, hey, stop. Why are we wasting everybody's time? I know what they're looking for. I know what they want. We can't get it to them because we don't have a contract. And once we get the contract signed, that's when you can actually say, hey, I need a schedule put out, and we can go out and at least tell you more information. So a lot of times when you don't have that information, they really don't know. And I'm not going to feed you something where I'm guessing. Yes, I have a little straw man that once I get the contractors, I can plug it in there and say, okay, here's how it fit. But prior to that, I don't even know when they can start on the side. And, and again, not up to us, it's up to the KO. And the KO, at this point right now, the KO is also the core. All I am is the a middle person, so we lost our 
previous core became the, the, the PD, so there is no core in place right now. So as, at the same time, I know there's been a core identified for Korea, and I've got the core identified for uh, the PAC right now. So I, I do have those core names, and the KO does have it. So at that time when she's ready, she's actually going to transfer that, that responsibility over to those particular organizations at that time. Go ahead. Could you go over some examples of what Tier 1 this trouble ticket would be and maybe draw a line so people can have expectations? <laughs> There's of my. That's my experience. It's a good question because one of the things that we want to we're trying to define is the Tier 1 and Tier 2 paths. Because you can ask three or four or five different people in this room and it all varies. So we're trying to find one standardized definition for Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, but typically a Tier 1 task is if they're having any type of desktop issue. Um, my laptop doesn't work. Um, then they go in and they you know, can fill in a ticket on the self um, request, service request model, SRM, fill in a ticket. That's routed to the desk. And then they can take care, usually take care of a desktop issue if they have the privileges and the rights to go in and do it. So, um, that's typical tier one type work. Tier two is more touch labor and work with them. So, so if it requires boots on the ground, then you would say that that means it's tier two. Like that makes our yes. Well, it's going to require someone to go out physically touch. to Windows 10, you know, we're at the bleeding edge here in the Pacific. We're going to be rolling it out uh, early next year. How does ASD tie into Windows 10? Because I get that question all the time. Well, you know, what are we going to do to support Windows 10? So again, it will come through the acquisition office first. Okay. We'll assist in that from start to finish in implementing Windows 10. Again, all those new acquisitions and anything that comes up, th those major changes, our office will be involved in assisting because right now we are we've been in all the Windows 10 meetings, briefings. We've already pushed an article, uh, knowledge articles out forward already. In that we're working with uh, Microsoft. We have that person on the team also. So and we were getting the lesson learned again from uh, Fifth in Europe. So we're pulling all that data, getting it all together, prepping. But again, we already know it's going to break some things and trying to get those fixes prior to it being rolled out. Because uh, at, at one time, it was going to be a delay. So now everybody's pushing. Same with uh, your 8.1 versus 9.1 and all that. Again, some say wait, some say go. Again, if it was in the operator's hand, you, you've, been, <laughs> you've already been moving out. Because it's in the PMO's hand, again, we're waiting for that decision from the operators to decide, which direction do you want to go? We'll support you wherever you want to go. That's the direction we want to go. But uh, uh, initial, initially, again, we will assist in, in that push out, that rollout. So it won't be left to the organization themselves. It's going to be back on us, back on our, in our office. Will it be a, a SME pod developed for Windows 10? So whereas when the users here in the Pacific have an issue, they call 1-800-ASD. You know, it, it gets attrition to your first, you know, that tier one, uh -huh. and, and then if they can't resolve it, it rolls over to a, a pod somewhere. Transparent to the customer, but to where that that process is already. It, it, it depends how much you go in. <laughs> one thing is um, that um, Netcom, I mean, their AGM team is overall responsible for rolling out Windows 10, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the initiatives that the program office is, uh, has put in place is an integrated resolver group. Implementation group um, that will be embedded with the AGM team, and they'll have help desk experience. They'll know, you know, the type of skills and so forth. So, if an end user is having problems with the Win 10 you know, implementation, they can call the Netcom AGM help desk. We'll have embedded help desk personnel with them to help them with that. So that is the plan going forward. I think. Yeah, so right now they have like, there's only 
probably like three or four experts that they have. So what we decided to do is get bodies to pull that knowledge from those guys and get it written down. What do you do what in different cases? We may not have it all, but instead of everyone trying to tie up those three bodies, we'll have a buffer between them where they've getting all that, that knowledge, already gathered the knowledge. If they didn't gather, they can go and seek it out. But if not, you will overwhelm them in a heartbeat, and we decided we need to do this. Now, it's going to cost us. We got the BPR guys that we gave you, and now we want the Resolve guys in between there. Can't pay for them both. And CIG 6 has already said, you're going to have to choose one or another. So we're not, I'm not making that decision. Again, it's up to the operator. Which one do you want most? And that decision will be made by the operators themselves. Nick, huh? Per se. Any other questions? Well, can I just introduce a couple of folks? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, no, as Palmer said, I'm Tammy Weiss. I, I work for Palmer out of PDOEIS um, at Fort Belvoir, but I'm stationed here at the 311 Signal Command as an AES <laughs> liaison. Um, Obi Blair works out of the 7 Signal Theater Signal Command at uh, Fort Gordon there in Augusta, Georgia. Um, you have Marty Barraza up here in the front who's been asking a couple questions. <laughs> He's the 311 Signal Command. PM working the project, very closely uh, involved with Mr. Mitchell out of the, the PEO's office. Um, you have Dave Bohr. <laughs> you know I was going to get you there. <laughs> Dave actually is a Unisys um, employee. He works as the customer relationship yes, manager yeah. that Palmer talked about um, a few minutes ago. Um, in the back corner, in the Hawaii shirt, he's always got something nice on. Uh, you've got John Beck, who's um, working Windows 10. He thinks that's priority over AES. I, I deal with him all the time. Um, but he's working, he's working uh, Windows 10, and he's the Baumgar project manager for 311s as well. Uh, Next to him, you have Jay enough. Hicks, who just walked in the room. He's the assistant PM for AESD that works very closely with Marty and the rest of the team as we put together the AESD here in the Pacific. So that, that gives you an idea of, okay. of the folks you have that are working on the project. And then the rest of the folks here, um, I don't know yet, the media <laughs> before we leave. Um, and if we've got any questions, then, then we're here. Yep. Thank you, All right. And I'm here to Thursday. Go ahead. I got one more question. Uh -huh. Maybe you're OB fans. From, from the discussion that you have, Top level with the netcom. What are some some of the solutions we see as far as shadow help desk uh, having them fall into the fold, uh, align with the with the enterprise? So th that that is the purpose of the federation. Again, w the study was conducted. A lot of the desks. Again, you gotta you gotta fight the culture, uh, and th and that's a big hurdle. Policy and culture will slow things down. If I have a, the, the seven, and it's 44 next, which belong to them, and it took me four years you know, to get them on board, thanks to someone who's outside, trying to get them to say, hey, again, when funding starts constricted, the head start nodding, you know what, I, I need some, I need a solution. And you have the, you know, less resistant, more the willing then. But until, until then, again, a lot of them want to sit back, let me watch and see what you're doing, how it's working for you, and if it's working well, uh, you know, maybe we will. Uh, we've had this over now looking at uh, Unisys headquarters. They've, they've been down there looking at it. So there's an the interest out there. Uh, uh, time will tell. It's, it's going to be a time now. Here's what he meant to ask. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you call, if you put in a service desk request now, okay, and it requires someone to come out and look at your computer. You're gonna be there a while. So how do you? So how do you get that request that you, you put in? Submit people who are currently doing that function mm -hmm. integrated into your remedy uh, with the different tier levels that you want to. 
Again, so, so right now, initially what we do is, is the knowledge articles assist even the, if I get a call, that, that um, technician looks and says, hey, this is referenced, this particular issue, only pe people that can work on that goes to that particular person. And they relate, they are actually routed that way. Again, it's the push of all the knowledge article, and that's why we have someone down there sitting down saying, hey, what is your process? How do you work currently? Who are those that don't fall into the norm? Uh, the way that this works right now, and how, who's the one that actually service that? And if it's, again, a touch labor, again, ASE does not do the touch labor, per se, but again, if, you, if that's some of the service you want and that's a requirement, again, that's something that they would have to uh, fund for. So one, one thing, um, in seventh, right, the, um, the commander general at the time, John Baker, um, basically wanted any shadow help desk to be done away with completely, right? Because he, um, he put out a policy that he did not want his civilian workforce to be doing two or one type work that the Army has already paid the Army Air Force Service Corps to do, right? So policy drove to get rid of the shadow help desk. Um, and because Touch labor force is not affected by the AESD. The service desk that we're running now is taken out of hide some other other sections. So when the AESD comes into place for us, it's good because now I can use free some bodies to resource yeah. requirements. But I think in general, I don't think you're well, I don't think General Baker or anybody else is gonna get be able to get rid of the shadow help desk totally for, for, for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of them do above baseline support. I'm pretty sure the ASD is not going to do battle command system support. Right. Some well, commands manage their own blackberries and things like that, and so there's still going to be some help desk requirement. Um, also, too, there's just some folks that are going to be able to help themselves. 25th ID, for example, they've got you know soldier power in the G6 um, for several reasons. They again, as you mentioned, you know it's 72 hours by C4IM catalog yep. for us to come out and touch a computer. Um, I don't know anybody that, that would want to sit around for 72, 72 hours, hours waiting. Work pile up. Um, so some people who want to do get faster service than that, this is our baseline. And if they're willing to use their 25 Bravos and their, their G6 staff to do it, I don't know that we could tell them not to. Um, yep. I would like to be able to be quicker. I would like to have more people in the tier two, uh, uh, you know, touch labor force. But uh, you know, again, I'm seeing numbers cut, not numbers increase. Yeah, sorry. Real quick on that. So the BlackBerry thing, BlackBerry 5 goes out in December. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have any legacy BlackBerries, know that they're not going to work after that. And then after that, all the BlackBerries are actually controlled by the yeah. ASD, BlackBerry 10. So yeah, we, we, we control a lot of that. Um, they're do the when it comes down to the shadow help desk, that's kind of my job, is to go out there and try to get them to want to take ownership of ASD. You know, and a fact of, <laughs> The ticketing system now, the way the 30th has it, you know, set up with, with uh, Remedy 8, is people can go in and put in their own tickets. So the IMOs can put in their own tickets and actually resolve issues. We just have to get them to come in and take ownership of putting those tickets into 8.1 and be able to do the work. So it's not having to wait 48 hours. You can wait an hour. The IMO just has to put the ticket in, go do the work, resolve, or, you know, put the information in the ticket and get it resolved. And we're trying to work that process out. We're, I'm trying to get with all the little ghost help desks. And, you know, I mean, they've got their own ticketing system. They've got their own system. They have their own IMOs. And a lot of units do have their own IMOs. That's your tier two. I know people are asking about that. But I know with some of the people at the 30th is that they're setting up a group of IMOs for those units that don't have. And then that's where we can work with them a little bit better when we have these tickets to come in. We can assign it to that group faster and try to get a quicker result. So I know it's 72 hours, but I know we do want to try to move that process. I was an IMO before I came on board as a 
customer relationship manager, so I understand the heartaches that the people have, and you know, at the at the IMO level. So we're trying to work that in and make that process a little bit better. One of the other things that you're going to see is you're going to start seeing. Yes. So the reality on the ground is completely different than what you guys are asking for me. So it's impossible for me to tell my boss or the CT take care of, we can't do anything um, with a health center, with a VA. It's impossible. Well, I understand. I mean, that's not the reality on the ground. So I think we really have to look at it from the ground forces um, point of view of how that impacts us as a V6 on the shadow help desk when pretty much there ain't no help desk at all and just point um, our CT to a sub call. Uh, and again, that's why I mentioned culture is not going to let you do it. I got to do it. If I've been set up this way and I've been operating this way and I want it now, guess what? And CG says, guess what? You're going to do what you're going to do. I, I, I can't tell, and I don't have the authority to say this is what you will do. None at all. And that's what I was going to add for, for at the 25th in particular. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure the G6, I'm, I'm sure that you don't want somebody to be out. Let's say it's one of the you know, primary staff and not know about it, they put in a ticket and you don't have visibility of it That's and all of a sudden yeah. you're getting choked by the boss. Uh, <laughs> but also from the 30th perspective, um, our workforce keeps getting cut. We absolutely depend on those IMOs as part of the team and those folks. And so um, frankly, if, if, if it gets locked down so much that they can't do, they can't help us as part of the team, we're gonna break. We're gonna yeah. break and we're gonna fail miserably. Right. And they don't see ADSD and they don't see 311, they see whatever, they call us, or they'll call EASD, and you're gonna get screamed at by somebody who just blames the 30th signal battalion. They don't care who's actually doing it, so. And, and, and don't get the wrong impression, when, when I'm saying that I know should go away, I'm, because they play a very, very critical role. Um, what we've done in seven is we've tried to get the IMOs to drive all the volume through ADSD, because at certain times, depending on the type of task or, or the incident, ASD could possibly solve that, resolve that much faster than, than, than an IMO. So it's, it's, it all depends. Um, we know that IMOs play a critical role in, in, in the end. So we're not saying that IMOs are going to go away or anything, but there are certain instances where if they're submitted through the ASD, ASD could potentially, you know, potentially solve that. Um, so here's the form. Um, all the enterprise services, all of that email, um, all of that goes to the Army Enterprise Service Center. They have rights and privileges on the enterprise side to do certain things. Now, for, as far as C4AM stuff, totally they're not there yet. So. I, I think um, when we first did the year eight that one was really, um, the challenge was educating uh, the people on the ground how to put the tickets in the system correctly mm -hmm. so that it gets escalated with that Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Um, this is a CG, these VIPs, we put them in certain categories. Yep. And so his priority is different than the normal usual, but that culture of educating those on the ground on how to work that ticketing system, what priority, and making sure they put the information in there correctly. Because when we send it to, um, I'm a director of regional services. Mm -hmm. And so when it gets escalated for my guy,
I get the emails from CGEs, my boss gets them, and we're answering questions like, why didn't it get acted on? Well, it never said, in the, in, in the process, the person submitted it as a regular ticket. If we knew it was a CG, if they knew it was a CG, believe me, they, they stop and act on it. But again. So that's a great point. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's really his mission. Yeah, identifying the VIPs right now, we're working with the 30th, and we are going to um, put out to try to get all the VIPs listed that are out there, and I know it changes. Well, not just a VIP, but, but a, we, we provide manpower, a green sweeper that has the understanding of what's going on on the ground and sit directly at the desk um, with those um, personnel. So now, Do you, do you do that now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now from, a, from a networking standpoint, but from a services standpoint, we don't have that. You can do that with a battalion. Yeah. We have a thing called troops attached. No, we have put out yeah. where you can send folks as soon as the service attached, uh, yeah. and, and they go through about, and hopefully it's for 90 days, mm -hmm. and they will work only your tickets for 25th, the priority your stuff, and then they leave fully empowered, knowing who everybody is, wherever you is, to go back to you. We, we have that now. We yeah. don't get a lot as much participation as we'd like. Yeah. And we have that same program at the seventh. However, the social do not integrate that with get. They integrate that with next. Right. So we so yeah. We well, right, right now the service that's getting that the neck because we have done this um, with the with the neck over on uh, with get. And then and then they actually go out actually they're doing it. It's, it's kind of co-located with our RNOPs right now. So yeah. but so but yeah. yeah. And real quick, when we say put everything through A or D, if you guys submit your own tickets and you do your own work, it still gets submitted to us because then we can track the metrics and we can start seeing trends and follow them. And that's all it comes down to is submitting those tickets for the work that the IMOs do at the IMO level. As long as those tickets go in, you can do whatever you want because then you can resolve them, close them, you can call us up and get some more assistance. And then on the DISA level, we have full sight of the DISA tickets that we put in and we can track. And actually the guys over at Seven are working real close with DISA. So we see and track everything that's going on there too. Yes, sir. Oh, different question. Go ahead. Your uh, tier one help desk mm -hmm. folks, are they going to be considered IAT level one or two or three? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be one and two. There's a reason why I ask. One? IAT level one. Okay. So IT level one and twos, they can fulfill their 8570 training requirements. Correct. So, so again, as I mentioned, you were probably one here earlier. Bongar with Windows 10, with all the shutdown with it right now, Bongar is not working. Okay, so that's uh, fifth. I've been told has found a workaround. Don't know how they work around it. Don't know what they did. Uh, so we've been talking to them, trying to get their hey, send us what you got, and how did you did what you did. So we haven't gotten that, and they want to send it on the high side, so it tells me they might have done something that we probably can't use anyway. <laughs> but it's still coming. It is coming, and, and, and again, it may be another remote type of 
instance we have to use, but Baumgart right now may die. We, we have accepted that, that, hey, we may have to find another way to access. Yep, so we, we're aware of that. That's great. To do skill, to do skill level. That's correct. My understanding is you're going to have folks at different skill levels anyway at the ASD. Mm -hmm. Some who do a simple unlock an account and yeah, some exactly. network, network expertise. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and as Mr. Richard said, it's all uh, based on the skill level routing. You know, whatever your instinct is, it's routed to the appropriate skill level. And we're already working that out as far as certifications and everything coming in. So we have people who are already Security Plus certified and we have A Plus certified people. Any other questions? I made my hour. Yeah, the last place we did, we only had 30 minutes. So I was under the impression I had 30 minutes. I was sharing another 30 minutes with someone else. And then I come to find out, I got an hour? What do you mean an hour? I didn't cut everything. So yeah, it's great. It worked out good. All right, if no question, I appreciate all of your <laughs> questions and time. Thank you for your time, sir. All right, and I'll see you later on this afternoon. Most definitely. Okay.